Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll get started uh, right away. I apologize uh, for the uh, slight delay in our program uh, this morning, but uh, Foreign Minister Vestavella was in the midst of some very important, as I think we can all appreciate, meetings at the Treasury Department. He assures me that everything is all resolved, as he's about to tell us um, in his uh, presentation this morning, so the markets can rest easy now. Um, I'm Fiona Hill, uh, the Director of the Centre for the United States and Europe here at the Brookings Institution. And uh, first of all, I'd just like to uh, welcome everyone here and uh, Foreign Minister Vestavella. On behalf of the institution, our President Strobe Talbot, who unfortunately couldn't join us today, and also the head of the uh, Foreign Policy Programme, Martin Indyk, who also unfortunately is not here. Uh, but you were here, uh, a very large audience. We also have an overflow room. And uh, we would also like to say hello to all the audience of C-SPAN, who are covering this and all of the other uh, media outlets that we have here today. This is obviously a very important speech uh, that we're here present for. And we would like to thank Foreign Minister Vestavella for making the time to come to talk to us in between so many important meetings. He's leaving at 12 o'clock uh, to go and meet with Secretary Clinton. So we would like, of course, not to delay that uh, meeting uh, in any way whatsoever. So I'm going to hand over right away to uh, Foreign Minister Vestavella for his presentation. And he's graciously offered to take a number of questions from the audience. And we'll try to accommodate as many of you as we can. So thank you very much, Foreign Minister Vestavella. Thank you for joining us. Dear Fiona Hill, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, I'm delighted and honored uh, to be guest uh, of the Brookings Institution today. And I'm especially pleased to see so many friends of uh, Europe in the audience here. I really want to apologize that uh, I'm a bit uh, late. I'm sorry for this delay, but it is the truth. I just had a meeting with uh, Timothy Geithner and uh, it was very in in intensive, it was constructive. And if this helps to relax the markets, uh, well, it's fine. Um, the famous line in Mark Twain's memories about Wagner is also true for Europe. The music is better than it sounds. <laughs> and I say this as a great fan of both, of Richard Wagner and of the European integration. I know that there are many questions and concerns about uh, Europe these days. I followed a bit the internal discussions about Europe in this uh, um, important and crucial time in the United States of America. Questions about the current crisis and what it means for Europeans, Americans and other around the globe. Questions also about Germany's approach to the crisis, about the place it sees for itself in Europe. I have come here to answer four fundamental questions as openly and directly as possible. What is the nature of the crisis we are facing? What are we trying to achieve? What is Germany's role in all of this? And of course, what's in it for the United States? First, the nature of the crisis. The term Euro crisis is from my point of view convenient but misleading. It, in its first 10 years, the common currency has been remarkably successful by any standard. Its exchange rate and inflation rate are as stable as that of the Deutsche Mark. The Euro has assumed the role of a second global reserve currency in times of globalization, the euro was the right thing to do. If we, did not, if we did not have it, we would have to invent it now as a lesson learned from the financial crisis that would have had worse effects without a common currency. But it's also obvious that a number of European countries are no longer enjoying sufficient trust in the financial markets. The reasons are slightly different in each case, but three things are at the root of this crisis. To begin with, the word financial crisis as the trigger. Secondly, excessive public and private debt and growing macroeconomic imbalances as a result of lacking competitiveness and flaws in Eurozone governments. 
all of these factors are interlinked in the aftermath of the financial crisis of 2008, the state had to rescue an over-leveraged and ill-invested banking sector. At the same time, it had to provide a huge fiscal stimulus for the economy. The German fiscal stimulus, by the way, was comparable in relative size to US efforts at the time. As a result, financial markets started questioning the ability of some Eurozone members to repair their debt or to grow their way out of the debt burden, first in Greece, then in Ireland, then in Portugal. The debt crisis morphed into a crisis of confidence, questioning the political will and determination of Eurozone members to fix the flaws in the construction of the monetary union. Second, what we are trying to achieve. There are those who argue that an early and massive rescue operation would somehow have prevented the crisis from developing. As if some sort of unlimited guarantee of Greek sovereign debt by all, over, by all other Eurozone members in the spring of 2010 could have put everything on hold. I frankly don't think that this argument holds up. It focuses exclusively on the contagion issue, but completely ignores the deeper origins of the crisis. The same is true in my view for the argument that Germany, Europe's anchor of stability, somehow misreads the nature of the crisis. That we are trying to amend the rule book instead of putting out the fire. From the very beginning, we have focused on a double track strategy, linking solidarity with partners under pressure, with a firm commitment to fix the Eurozone and put all members on a path of fiscal responsibility. Both is necessary and both is interlinked. So our philosophy in this present crisis is that we on the one hand have to erect the firewall, that we have on the one hand to fight against this present crisis, but that we on the other hand also have to be aware long-term engagement is necessary, long-term solutions are necessary, structural reforms are necessary, otherwise this kind of crisis would hit us every few months, every few years again, and we wouldn't solve the problem. We wouldn't uh, only heal the symptoms, but we wouldn't care about the root and the causes for the crisis we are in. So from our point of view, both is necessary. And if we explain this as a politician, as a German politician, it's crystal clear for us, we have to show and we show solidarity but on the other hand, we have to use the opportunity, the chances in this crisis that we solve the structural crisis, that we give answers to the deficits and to the flaws of the construction in the construction of the Eurozone. Let me emphasize this point again because it represents the core of our approach. There are those who argue that we underestimate the severity of the crisis, that we mistakenly focus on long-term remedies for what is in reality a short-term problem. My answer is, it is actually this argument itself that underestimates the nature and the scope of the crisis. Yes, we need short-term crisis management, but we should not opt for measures that would lay the ground for an even bigger crisis in years to come. And most importantly, our short-term measures will only be credible and effective if we address the root causes at the same time. Some think in the public opinion, some discuss it in the sense that a long-term solution is uh, something we should answer 
in a few months after the present crisis is solved. If our, if our idea, if our analysis is right, and we think it is right, that we are in a present crisis which started as a debt crisis, which morphed into a crisis of confidence, then also a long-term answer is necessary to solve this crisis of confidence. The long-term answer, the sustainable answer, is also important for the international markets, for all the citizens worldwide who want to see that European knows what it has with the European Union and with our common currency. So the combination of both is necessary. It is a comprehensive approach which we um, discuss and which we uh, have as a guideline in our policy. Solidarity with countries having liquidity problems is an indispensable part of our effort. We are now in the final stage of setting up a permanent European stability mechanism to deal with liquidity problems. Germany's share of these financial guarantees is more than a quarter of the total. The German Parliament has approved financial guarantees for more than 200 billion euro. Translated into the size of the US economy, this would be the equivalent of far more than one trillion US dollars in guarantees by the US Treasury. I think this is a remarkable answer. More than 200 billion euros on the table, expressing and showing solidarity knowing that this is our responsibility in the interest of Europe, but also, of course, in our well-defined national interest as a national economy in the Federal Republic of Germany. But please, one trillion, if I compare it to your size, to the American size of the economy, one trillion dollar. Would this mean, if I translate it to you and to your country, and just um, answer the question to yourself, can you imagine members of Congress approving such a sum to help out non-Americans? The theory that Germany is not demonstrating solidarity with its fellow Eurozone partners in trouble is an urban legend and simply not accurate. The European Central Bank also has a very important role in managing the crisis. It will do what it considers necessary and appropriate with its mandate. It is not for me to comment or to give advice because you know that the European Central Bank is independent and it was one of the German goals in the negotiations 15 years ago that the European Central Bank is independent and not has to follow political orders. First, the core, of the, uh, I'm sorry, the core of the problem, however, goes even deeper than providing liquidity. The crisis of confidence requires decisive action on two fronts. First, we have to fix the flaws in the Eurozone's construction. When setting it up shortly after the fall of the Berlin Wall, we were not able to go all the way and create a political union side by side with the economic and monetary union. It took a while for the consequences of this failure to become apparent because we enjoyed a decade of low interest rates and strong economic growth, especially, especially in Southern Eurozone members. This made it so tempting and easy to neglect the dangerous productivity and competitiveness gap with the Eurozone. We thought we were doing well even without stronger coordination of fiscal and economic policies. This was a mistake. We also allowed the hallmark of our monetary union, the stability and growth pact, to be hollowed out and violated numerous times without real consequences. This was another mistake. And we, we, did, not to, we did not reduce public and private debt in good times this was our third mistake. 
we are now addressing and correcting all three of them. This is why we have pushed for change to the European treaties. This is why we hope to conclude a new fiscal compact by the end of this month. With, the, with this compact, we will firmly establish the principles of future fiscal responsibility. We will introduce strong debt break. We call this debt break, if I translate it into uh, American language, into English. Provisions, we, we introduce strong debt break provisions in member states' legal frameworks. And we will significantly strengthen policy coordination within the Eurozone and its prospective members. I'm confident that most non-Euro members of the EU will join in this effort. Our door will also remain open to Great Britain. Yet in my view, Tighter rules and better coordination cannot be the end of the story. We have to recognize that we need nothing less than a paradigm change for our countries and our society. The debt economy itself has reached its limits. Fiscal responsibility and sustainability are not a cane concepts for experts nor are they awkward hobbies of Germans still traumatized by memories of hyperinflation three generations ago. They are the imperative of our time. The policies of debt, combined with the shortcomings of the Eurozone construction and compounded by the effects of the financial crisis, have led us into the danger zone. We have taken it too far beyond the point of credibility. And allow me the question, as a guest, with all modesty and politeness, can we really be sure that this is only a problem of the Eurozone? It is the triple origin of the crisis that defies all the easy answers, all the big bazooka remedies put uh, forward by economists and pundits on both sides of the Atlantic and on the island in between. That is why we are focusing our efforts on creating a union of stability in Europe and moving towards fiscal sustainability and growth here and now. We cannot postpone this fundamental change of direction to a distant future. Rescue packages and short-term liquidity are not a solution of, to the crisis. They are buying us time in which to address the root causes, no less, but also no more. The key is therefore to strike the right balance between easing the short-term pain and lying, laying the foundations for a long-term gain. Europe has decided to no longer ease the symptoms of the crisis by fighting debt with more debt. This is an enormous challenge. It will be neither easy nor quick, neither easy nor quick, but it is the only viable path for a stronger Europe in the future. Our partners in Greece, in Ireland and in Portugal and many other countries deserve our respect and our support for the efforts and sacrifice they have made. When we discuss the merits of this argument, let us not overlook the different demographic realities of our societies. In Germany and many parts of Europe, every euro of debt will have to be shouldered by fewer and fewer taxpayers in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, by no means do I advocate austerity only. Apart from the debt issue, the widening gap in competitiveness between Eurozone members is the most important cause of the crisis. Budget cuts alone will not do the trick. Structural reforms are essential for the creation of new growth. 
They are also essential for the long-term cohesion of the Eurozone. It is simply not acceptable that one out of five, that one out of five Europeans under the age of 25 is without a job. In some countries, we are even talking about one out of three. Here we can and we must do better. Reforming labor markets is only one element, but a very important one. We know what, from our own experience 10 years ago, when Germany was singled out as the sick man of Europe, that these reforms are politically difficult, but very beneficial for long-term growth and employment. With other words, Germany is asking and urging for structural reforms, but we do not ask any other country in Europe or in the Eurozone for more than we did by ourselves in our own country. Structural reforms are decisive because a currency is only as strong as uh, the economies of the countries behind the currency are successful. This is the very change, uh, this is the very challenge that some of our partners in Europe are now facing. Others, like for example the Baltic states, have already successfully implemented these reforms and have returned to solid growth. And we will do more. We will employ unused EU structural funds to stimulate economic growth. We will focus the upcoming EU budget for the years 2014 to 2020 on an innovation and new technologies and move away from subsidizing the economy of yesterday. A budget, by the way, to which Germany will be the biggest net contributor. And finally, we should never lose sight of the benefits of free trade. We work hard to expand free access to the emerging markets. Shouldn't we also put the issue of a transatlantic free trade area high on our agenda? A free trade area that is not weakening our WTO efforts for global free trade. We are, after all, more deeply integrated through trade and investment ties than any other two economic areas of the world. This brings me, ladies and gentlemen, to my, to my third question. What is Germany's role in all this? When you look at most of the public commentary, you can't help but feel a dilemma. We are either criticized for being too cautious in addressing the crisis or for being too dominant in dictating our own policies to others. We take both views seriously and we believe both are beside the point. To be, per to be perfectly clear from the outset, there is no good future for Germany without a good future for United Europe. While there, is an, that while there are undoubtedly differences in opinions among German political parties on the details of crisis management, there is a broad consensus that the answer to the current crisis has to be more Europe, not less Europe. Germany is and remains deeply and firmly committed to a united Europe. The integrated single European market is the basis of our wealth and economic prosperity. The integrated decision-making in Brussels, while often tedious and full of compromises, has been the basis of more than six decades of peace among the European Union member states. The integrated trade and foreign policies are our best chance to preserve our European way of life and to assert our values and interests in a globalized world with new centers of power. Going it alone is not an option for Germany. 
however strong our economy may be. History has taught us, with chapters too dark to forget, that European integration was and remains the only convincing and viable answer to the so-called German question. This fundamental insight continues to guide our policies. I'm personally deeply committed to the idea of a European Germany. And, and allow me, beside this um, text and my prepared speech, to make a very personal remark to you here in Washington. I was born in 61, so I'm the first generation with parents who grew up in time of Second World War. And for us, for my generation, Europe and the European Union was always more than just a single market or a common currency or monetary system. I remember the talks with my parents difficult enough about the Nazi time and the war. I remember in the 60s and when I was a bit older in the 70s when I went to school how it was to travel to other European countries, to our neighbor countries. I remember when I was in the age probably of 14 or 15 or even a bit younger, when I traveled to France, to the Atlantic coast in the Bretagne by tent. I remember in the middle of the 70s that I was there with three friends <laughs> traveling around the Bretagne with tents and railway. And I wanted to buy something in real rural area in a single room shop. And there was a lady, the owner of this single room shop. She was, from our point of view in those times, very old. <laughs> she was in my age now. <laughs> and um, we were, I think, three boys in this single room shop. She wore her traditional clothes. Some of you have been there. You know what I mean. In those days, there were no touristic reasons to wear this. And I was very slim, fair hair, blue eyes, horrible accent when I tried to speak French. <laughs> was really a torture for everyone. <laughs> Je voudrais l'addition, s'il vous plaît. Une tante pour trois personnes. It's something like that. But it was a very serious, impressive moment for the rest of my life. We were in this room, and it was easy to see that I was German in the middle of the 70s. And this lady, who was the owner of the shop, didn't serve us. She went out of the shop to this room, a little kitchen behind this single room shop. And we could hear that she started to cry. She, wasn't, she didn't want to serve us. And then the daughter came out of this kitchen. And she talked to us, three young men, 14, 15 years old. And she said, I apologize, boys. This has nothing to do with you personally, but my father, her husband, was killed in Second World War by the Germans. And if you grew up in this situation, 
I think you would understand by the deepest of your heart that Euro and Europe is always more than a single market and a common currency. It is the answer to the darkest chapter in our history and it's also our life insurance in times of globalization. And please forgive me that I want to underline my personal commitment and the commitment of my generation, the European commitment of the Germans with this very personal remarks. But probably you understand that for us, this is not a technical question. It's a historical question for us. And this will, will may prove you and show you that the German commitment about Europe and the Eurozone is out of discussion. However, it would be wrong to deny that there are different visions of what Europe should be. There are those who do not want an open, tolerant and integrated Europe. There are those who stress the differences by their ethnics of religious rather than what unites us. They are advocating a fortress Europe. This is a vision that we need to oppose forcefully. The renationalization in a time of globalization is a dangerous concept, and this is a message to whom it may concern. The financial, political, and human cost of a dis disintegrating Europe would be crippling, and it would be foolish to believe that Europe could withdraw into some sheltered corner. Yet it is only if we can put our own house in order that we can seriously and credibly establish Europe as a strong political actor on the global stage. I'm deeply convinced that Europe has something to offer beyond preserving its wealth and its own security we are a community of values. We are founded upon the fundamental rights of the individual. Our European model of shared sovereignty can be an inspiration in a globalized world in need of order. This leads me to my fourth and my final point. What's in it for the United States? I firmly believe in what Vice President Joe Biden said so eloquently in his speech to the Munich Security Conference three years ago. I was there and I could listen to him. In sharing ideals and searching for partners in a more complex world, he said, Americans and Europeans still look to one another before they look to anyone else. This is to add my own words, this is what we have done in the past. This is what we are doing today. This is what we have to do in the future. The effects of globalization confront us with new challenges, from climate change to water and food shortages, from cybersecurity to the protection of the global commons. New powers are rising faster than we could foresee only a few years ago. The growing economic weight increasingly translates into political weight. Every government on our two continents is shifting resources towards fast growing new centers of power in Asia and elsewhere. And yet, when we confronted the pressing issues of today, it is above all Americans and Europeans who share the same values, interests, objectives, and resources. We continue to fight alongside each other in Afghanistan. At the Bonn Conference in December, we pushed forward our joint strategy for a gradual transfer of responsibility to the Afghan authorities. We are working on a political solution to prevent the country from ever again becoming a safer haven, a safe haven for terrorism. We stand firmly together in confronting Iran's 
increasingly dangerous course. And for us, like for many of you, the security of Israel is raison d'etre. The European Union will put into place a new and very substantial round of sanctions this coming Monday to forcefully make the point that Iran's behavior in the nuclear issue is unacceptable and a danger to world peace. We are looking, we are working closely together and with our partners in the Arab League to address the ongoing bloodshed in Syria where a brutal regime resorts to violence and uh, violence against its own people. We are joining forces to support the transformation underway in the Arab world towards more representative, more participatory political systems. Both America and the European Union put a particular emphasis on the empowerment of women as a key to successful transformation. We work closely together to facilitate a negotiated and lasting peace between Israelis and Palestinians. We will reaffirm our close alliance at the NATO summit in Chicago in May, an alliance and of collective defense, an alliance that gives itself the means to be an element of stability in an increasingly fragile world. Possibly the most important common task of all will be to restore the legitimacy and viability of our economic model. The proper regulation of the global financial system is still unfinished business. We have to continue to work on it together and in the G20 framework. This includes making sure that the IMF has what it takes to play its crucial role in the global system. If we do not address these issues in a convincing fashion, we will face a systemic crisis of legitimacy that by far transcend our two economies. It would undermine our own political systems and it would sharply diminish our ability to successfully promote our values and interests globally. Ladies and, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, when I look at the American debate over the past weeks, I see mostly a caricature of Europe. The image of a continent mired in gloom and self-absorption. I beg to differ. First point we actually overcame socialism in Europe 20 years ago. And we owe this, among others, to the firm commitment to the idea of freedom by both democratic and republican American administrations. Secondly, the World Economic Forum's most recent global competitiveness index lists seven European countries in its top 10 list. Three of them are members of the Eurozone. European companies are among the fastest growing businesses in America, investing billions of dollars and creating thousands of jobs in this wonderful country. Finally, Europe is the largest donor of development, assistance, and humanitarian aid across the globe. In short, Europe is a strong and a vibrant continent, and I firmly believe that we will emerge stronger from this crisis. My vision of our future strategic partnership sees the United States and the United Europe at the core of the enlarged West. In a world, with new centers of power agreement between the US and the EU will no longer be sufficient to shape global solutions. But we can, and we should be a motor of progress. We have to engage with new powers and bring on board new partners in order to build a broader consensus. In a world where the idea of freedom continues to gain strength it is imperative 
that the West, the cradle of freedom, stands together. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Foreign Minister Vestival. I think, as you can see from the uh, rounds of applause uh, that you received, this was a very powerful and well-received uh, speech. And I think many of the people in the audience, uh, when you were relating your personal story from uh, Brittany and your tour in France, um, I was looking at the audience and everyone had fallen very silent and very thoughtful. I think that really made um, a big impact on the way that people think about the exercise that you and uh, our other colleagues in Europe are engaged in uh, right now. So thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. Um, I will also uh, look to some of your colleagues uh, from uh, the Foreign Ministry and Embassy to signal uh, to me with um, a meaningful gesture when you need to leave because we certainly don't want to hold you up from the important issues you have to discuss today. But I know that there are a lot of questions. Uh, some people have already tried to attract my attention. So what I will do, uh, if it's okay with you, I will try to group uh, maybe two or three questions uh, together. I'll keep a note of them in case uh, we lose track. And we'll try to fit in as many questions um, as possible. Obviously, you've covered a lot of territory in your speech. The primary points were about the Eurozone and what Germany and other European countries are doing uh, to tackle all of the issues you laid out. But you also touched at the end upon some of the issues that you're here to discuss, the upcoming summit uh, in, in May in Chicago for NATO. Uh, there may be some questions about that. You talked about your discussions uh, with the uh, United States counterparts on issues related to the Arab Spring, to Syria, to Iran, uh, the Arab-Israeli uh, peace process. Uh, the, so there are many issues that perhaps people here in the audience may want to cover. But I'll start with uh, Michael Holtzel, um, one of our colleagues from across the road at SAIS, uh, who also used to work with uh, someone you uh, quoted today, uh, Joe Biden, uh, before he became uh, the vice president. And as you will probably recognize from uh, Mr. Holtzel's name, he has some German connections. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister, uh, for a really stimulating and heartfelt speech. I, I would take issue with only one thing you said, Let me, and that was the rhetorical question at the beginning of your speech when you asked whether the United States would commit the equivalent of a trillion dollars to essentially help non-Americans out of their economic problems. With all due respect, I think that's what you would call in your country falsche Fragestellung. I mean, that's the wrong question to ask. The question is whether, I would submit, uh, Americans from wealthier, more competitive parts of the United States, through their elected political representatives, would agree to appropriate money to help the country as a whole, especially their, citi their fellow citizens elsewhere. And I think this is probably what the European Union is striving toward. And in that regard, I'd like to pose the question about Eurobonds. It's something you didn't bring up. It's often talked about. As I understand it, the uh, federal government has basically said that it won't consider this essentially until after the elections next year. I wonder how you feel about Eurobonds as, as, as a means of, of showing the solidarity that you've expressed uh, both in terms of short-term and long-term. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, Clara uh, O'Donnell? And if people could introduce themselves to the minister as well before they ask a question. Thank you. Um, Clara O'Donnell, visiting fellow at the Centre on the Western Europe here at Brookings. You mentioned the UK. Um, I was wondering if you could give further details of your assessment of the UK's response to the Eurozone crisis so far. And then a, a gentleman um, right at the uh, very back here, please. Ian Talley, Dow Jones, Wall Street Journal. I'm wondering, uh, the negotiators are in Greece right now, uh, hoping to close a deal. I'm wondering whether you have hopes for a deal to be done uh, before Monday. And secondly, um, uh, you made very clear in your speech uh, Germany's commitment to United Europe. Uh, is there, um, can you characterize how far that commitment extends? Um, is there a point at which, politically or economically, that uh, Germany will not commit to a united Europe? Uh, Foreign Minister, uh, so we have a question about Eurobonds as a means of solidarity, the UK response 
And then a very pertinent question about how far uh, Germany uh, will uh, commit itself uh, to uh, the enterprise at hand, and of course about the, uh, the deal that uh, we're expecting before Monday. Chris? Michael Hofer, I would like to, um, to answer to your answer, if you allow, because you used this wonderful German phrase, falsche Fragestellung. Uh, falsche Fragestellung in, in Germany is a very well used term by politicians if they don't want to answer the richtige Frage. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I said nothing else that there is a cliche and there is a stereotype in the public discussions. Germany is not committed clear enough, they do not show enough solidarity. Europe and the Eurozone is not active enough, are not quick enough in their decisions. The opinion leaders, the governments are too weak. They discuss more than they act. And I think this is completely wrong. Because, I mean, um, you know what kind of discussions you had on the Hill about debts. <laughs> not my business. But then you can imagine how complicated it is to discuss and to decide such a size of solidarity in a totally different situation, politically different situation. You are one country, not since 10 years. And you have experienced structures, public services, parliaments, decisions, opinion leaders, White House, and so on and so on. When we are talking about Europe, please be aware, we have national countries in Europe. We are national countries, and we are together in a union. We are not one country yet. From my point of view, and I think you could read this between the lines of what I said, from my point of view, it is necessary to develop with the next chapter of integration, Europe more and more into this direction. But at the moment, we are not. At the moment, we are 27, probably after Sunday, uh, and the referendum in Croatia, 28. This year, next year, 28 member states. 27 national countries united under one political umbrella, with one parliament with limited authorities and possibilities. There is no one government. We do not have a president in the sense of you use the word president in America, in the United States. And this was the only thing why I wanted to compare it. So if there is a discussion, uh, in, in a public discussion, Germany does not do enough does not show enough solidarity. I just wanted to compare it with the size of our economies. I mean, we are 80 million citizens on the European continent. We are not the so-called superpower worldwide. Uh, we are, from our point of view, a very successful country, and we showed that we know uh, what we have to do in the last 10 years excellent growth rates, decreasing unemployment rate, a economic situation, a social situation, better than we had the most time uh, in, in, in uh, our history. So I just, wanted to, I just wanted to tell you 200 billions for Germany, more than 200 billions in Germany, euros we put on the table for solidarity with no doubt decided, with 80% support in the German Bundestag, all over the party lines, is really a lot. And I just wanted to ask that we do not underestimate this money and this, this uh, solidarity. This was the only fact, not to criticize my friends here in the United States. And uh, I mean, if you know me a bit longer, you know that I'm uh, working for the Transatlantic uh, Partnership and Friendship 
many years before I uh, became member of the German government. So if we are talking about more than 200 billion euro in Germany, it is in your ears, if you translate it into your situation, it is a thousand, more than a thousand billion dollars in, um, in the United States of America. This is the only thing I wanted to, I just wanted to explain, not to criticize anyone. Just wanted to translate it, because sometimes I have the impression uh, the expectation management about Germany is also necessary. Sometimes I think uh, uh, you look to Germany and think uh, we can shoulder everything. There is a responsibility to protect, but we always have to see the capability to protect and to help. Both is to balance. This was the only background of my uh, little <coughs> ironic remark. And um, also, if you please uh, just imagine how complicated sometimes is to decide. The European uh, institutions, with one exception, all other governments, all other parliaments, 26 parliaments, independent national parliaments, decided to support this agreement, decided to show solidarity, and decided to open the next chapter of European integration. And always was European integration the answer to the last crisis. This is normal. Eurobonds, what you said. My answer is very short and very simple. I do not think that you can solve a debt crisis by making it easier to take up new debts. To fight debts with debts doesn't work in the private life, and it does not work in countries, in nations. This is our authority and our, our idea. And please don't forget, once again, everything, what we asked for for structural reforms, we did before in our own country. Retirement age, and so on and so on. We did all this in our country. And this is the reason why I wanted to say, and now please put on my glasses. As, uh, I mean, not immediately, <laughs> uh, but put on my glasses and look to my glasses to the, uh, to the situation. Do you think that, uh, for example, some member countries in the European Union will work courageous on these structural reforms if we as Germans would say, you get the money, thank you, we are fine. So it's a mutual agreement. We show solidarity, but we ask those who ask for solidarity to do their homework, to fulfill and to work on the necessity of structural reforms. And competitiveness, we all know this, is the key question uh, in this uh, crisis for new growth and then, of course, for balance budget, which is, of course, our long-term goal. About United Kingdom, your uh, second question. Thank you so much for this. Um, I was also a bit ironical uh, because I just have been uh, in the United States after this 9th of December summit we had in Europe and then in the, in the European Union. And please understand, I know, of course, the public opinion in the United States of America is very much um, influenced by the discussion in Great Britain, which is very understandable so, because most American people do not follow our German language, which is obvious, of course. And of course, there's a long tradition and a, long, and, and a common cultural roots. There's no, no doubt about it. But what I want to say is, as German forester, as German foreign minister, I want to have Great Britain on board. Mm. And we have to work now, how can we build bridge over this troubled water to the continent? And this is, probably you have a professional background for your question, and you know this very well, it's not the first time. I want my money back. <laughs> 
when I was in your age, I never forget this uh, quote, of course, from a historical lady with uh, a later movie career. <laughs> <laughs> so I think this is, uh, uh, this is my answer. So I mean, you felt by my words that they were very kind, I think, and, and, and gentle and, and, and open-minded. It's a standing invitation. And address this in London to the public there. Third, Greece. I think we should stop as politicians or as responsible political leaders to answer hypothetical questions. If it is right, and I'm sure it is right, that there is a lack of confidence, that we are in a confidence crisis, I think it would be better that politicians and governments answer questions when they have to answer it, which means when the situation is there to answer a question. All these hypothetical questions misleads us. What would you do if? Well, if the spotlights would fall down, I would leave the room. <laughs> but probably it will not happen. And we work exactly on the opposite. This is why we fixed this spotlights. So uh, we have to answer it. We are working at the moment. We have a, we have a, a present. We have a present. We have a we have now a negotiation with the Troika in Greece. And we are waiting for the report. And I will not make comments to Greece and to the future of Greece before I could read the report, before I uh, couldn't receive, before I couldn't receive the report by the Troika, which is EZB, EZB and uh, Commission and uh, IMF. So this is my, my answer. And I have just been in Athens last Sunday. And I have I have the conviction that they know it is necessary to do the homework, that they know it is necessary to do the structural reforms. And I had a meeting also with the head of the uh, Nea Demokratia, Samaras, the so-called opposition leader, because their party is also a member in the government, in this government of Papademos. And I think they understood uh, that this is a crucial time and that everyone has to do its homework, uh, their homework at home. Thank you. Let me take uh, three more questions. A uh, gentleman right at the back uh, here, uh, then this gentleman here, and then over here. So we'll take the gentleman at the back first. I'm Basil Scarless. I used to deal with economic issues at the State Department in the past. My question is, uh, if Southern Europe and the periphery are introducing off, uh, austerity measures and structural reforms, is Germany prepared to introduce offsetting expansionary fiscal policies? And if not, have you no fear that Europe could be a continent in austerity and facing stagnation and recession? Thank you. And uh, just behind you. Paul Mazur, German Marshall Fund Congressional Fellow at the US House of Representatives. Uh, thank you for your talk, Mr. Westerwelle. Um, the EU summit has agreed on the 9th of December to increase IMF's firepower in order to prepare it, uh, the organization for um, further actions in the European debt crisis. Uh, the European leaders have invited partners all over the place to contribute to that well, in, in a total $600 billion package, um, whereas the German cr government is criticized by foreign partners um, for considering tax cuts at that time while, while its economy is still in a good shape, so while it's still competitive. So what's your plan to convince these leaders overseas to uh, contribute to the uh, European Union's plan to increase IMF's firepower. Vielen Dank, Herr Minister. Thank you. Thank you. And then the gentleman uh, here, please. Yeah. Oh, yeah. uh, Mr. Foreign Minister, the uh, loan mandate for the ECB is price stability. And with the expansion of the balance sheet of uh, double in the past five years and up to 2.7 trillion euros, I think, um, how can it achieve that mandate? Thank you. So three rather technical uh, questions here. And um, you ha you're having meetings with Christine Lagarde, uh, I believe, Yesterday while you evening, are here. Yes. Oh, you already have them. Yeah. So presumably some of these issues must have come up in that context. Well, uh, let me answer the first question because I, I think I understood the background of your, of your question. And it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it would be impossible to answer with yes or no or with uh, three words because it's, of course, it is an enormous, important uh, discussion what we have, not only in the European Union. I think we have this worldwide. 
uh, this uh, discussion. My opinion is that uh, it does not make sense in such a situation um, to help the, weak, the weaker countries in Europe and the Eurozone by weakening the stronger countries in Europe and the Eurozone. Just imagine in what kind of situation this discussion would take place if Germany wouldn't be so strong after the structural reforms in the last 10 years, and after especially uh, the wise policy of the German government in the last two years. <laughs> I have to say this. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is uh, I think this is the, this is the fact. I, I, I follow this discussion a bit that they, that some come to us and say, well, you have to reduce your competitiveness question about the taxes were asked. You have to be more careful. Don't be so dominant. Don't be so busy. <laughs> You're always so busy. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> but this is the reason. And just imagine what kind of solidarity we could bring into uh, this European uh, discussions without having such a strong economy. So my, my, my my point is, and my opinion is, instead of weakening the strong countries, we should strengthen the weaker countries. And this is necessary, especially in the field of uh, structural reforms. And never ever, I would go home to my busy German fellows and citizens, to the German taxpayers, who bring on the table more than 200 billion euro and tell them, well, you have to <coughs> You have to reduce your expectations, uh, work less. Uh, and, and if you just look, to, for example, to the, to the demographic situation, uh, from my point of view, many other countries will understand that, for example, the change in the retirement age and, and many other things will be the answer for many others. So I understood this. I think uh, it is necessary that the uh, stronger countries show their solidarity, but it is not the answer to uh, weaken them. So I think that the German economy is so successful is a plus, or the minus is positive, not uh, negative in this discussion. Uh, this, me, this, is, this answers the first part of your uh, second question, uh, and this is about the tax cuts and um, about this uh, present uh, uh, discussion uh, uh, where we have. Uh, who asked this uh, second question? I'm sorry, there you are, I'm sorry. Uh, about this uh, present discussion, what we have. Uh, what we decided is uh, that we um, support families and especially the medium-sized uh, companies in Germany. And we think, uh, and this probably we are right, if you look how we survived the recession of the two years, uh, 2008 and 2009, we think that um, the medium-sized companies, the medium-sized and the smaller-sized companies are the backbone of our economy, and therefore, we think it is right to support them and uh, to give them more uh, possibilities and more uh, capability. Uh, and about the IMF, you ask, uh, what does this mean? I cannot answer this at the moment, because the IMF didn't ask for a concrete, uh, uh, for a concrete uh, uh, support at the, uh, yet. Uh, and uh, of course, I will, uh, we will discuss this with the German Bundestag if there will be um, uh, a question addressed to countries worldwide and, of course, also to Germany. But uh, I think the IMF is uh, very important and they play a key, a key role for us. And uh, I just uh, can say if there would come up a question of Madame Lagarde, of the IMF, we would discuss it in the German government. And, of course, we would discuss it with the German Bundestag. And uh, we know how important the work of the IMF is. Uh, third question is about the uh, ECB. Um, I can only repeat what I said, and I have to, uh, I have to be very disciplined in uh, public discussions about the uh, European Central Bank. Because, especially we Germans, we always ask for the independency of the European Central Bank. And I think it does not make sense to give uh, public comment in this or in that direction which only could be misunderstood as uh, 
that have tried to intervene into their uh, policy, which I do not want to do. They did what they uh, think, they, they do what they think is necessary, and uh, I uh, describe what they did, but I think uh, I do not want uh, to uh, make comments to this because I'm, I'm not sitting here as, as, as a private person, I'm sitting here as a German foreign minister, and we are uh, discussing in this uh, wonderful private audience. Uh, <laughs> but enough is enough. Well, it's not quite as private, given uh, <laughs> some of our other colleagues who are with us uh, today. Um, let me um, take uh, three more questions, and I'll also look to our colleagues uh, from the embassy about when we need to leave. Can we take three more? Yes, good. Um, a gentleman um, here. Uh, a gentleman here, and I saw another hand uh, somewhere. Yes, and the gentleman over uh, by the wall. And, and please introduce yourselves when we ask yes. your question. Thank you for taking my question, uh, Mr. Westerwelle, Alex Privitera with N24. Um, my question goes to uh, solidarity that you spoke of uh, so eloquently. Um, one of the questions has been raised here in the UK, but also in other European countries, is whether Germany will commit to raising the cap of the combined force of the FSF the and the future ESM. The cap, yeah. uh, the 500, yeah, 500 billion uh, euro. Um, because you have come, you as the German government, have come under some kind of pressure, at least uh, uh, from uh, the Italian uh, Prime Minister Mario Monti, who has repeatedly in interviews with uh, Die Welt and then with a long interview in the Financial Times, uh, basically said, sent this message to Berlin. We're undergoing structural reforms, but in order to keep my country behind me, I need to show my people that interest rates on uh, Italian bonds are going down. Otherwise, I will probably be kicked out of power and the future could be much worse than it is at the moment. And in order to do that, I need a sign from the Europeans, and in this case, particularly for the Germans. And since you're so adamantly uh, opposed to the introduction of euro bonds, at least at this stage, there needs to be some kind of firewall, measurable increase of the firewall in place to impress markets and to get those spreads down. What do you respond to that? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, the gentleman here and then uh, over here. Yes. Uh, thank you. My name is Juri Schneller. I'm a student, student here in Washington. And you talked about the community of uh, ideals that we are sharing in Europe. And I would like to ask you in the face of uh, Libya and Tunisia and Egypt, uh, we have seen these uprising of democratic movements <clears throat> So how can we as Europeans, uh, who are all sharing these ideas, how can we ensure, especially in the future, that we support these democratic movements around the world and not just um, support them as long as it's not in our, demo uh, in our economic interest? Thank you. Thank you. And over here, I hope we can get the microphone passed maybe along the road. Oh, great. Thank you. Is this the last round? Um, I think so, yeah. unless your colleagues are... Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Minister, for your uh, speech today. The uh, part on the European Union was particularly heartfelt as a uh, student of it. Um, but I want to ask you about uh, NATO enlargement um, at the upcoming Chicago summit. I know that this is a uh, very uh, contentious issue, especially um, in light of the recent ICJ ruling on uh, Republic of Macedonia and the name dispute that they're having with Greece. I was wondering if you could give any insight on to where you see enlargement on the agenda and what the chances are for uh, Macedonia's accession. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, as we've just indicated, this is uh, the last round. So, if, uh, Foreign Minister, if there are other things that you would like uh, to say um, in wrapping up, um, please do so in the context of these questions. Well, I think Mr. Pervetera asked about Italy and the uh, situation of the new government, uh, uh, sit the situation and the interview Mr. Monti gave a few days ago in uh, Berlin. Uh, I have just been uh, to Rome, and I said there um, some words in public of respect of what the Italians are doing now. I have been to Lisbon in the last days, to Athens, and to Rome. And uh, I always had one message there, that... Germany appreciates 
and knows and have great respect to what these countries are doing now and what they are going through, especially uh, the middle class and the people in these countries. And I think it is the first time I remember since many, many years, and you know Italy very well. I think it's the first time since many, many years. I'm not sure if I ever can remember uh, such a situation that the government asked for support in the parliament for such a reform package and was supported in Italy by 70 or 80 percent of the MPs. Mm. So do not misunderstand me. Listen to what I say and what I said. We have a lot of respect to what these countries, to what these countries uh, did. And uh, I, I do not go to Roma or to Athens or to Lisbon as a teacher with this finger. Uh, we are there because we think we want to have a partnership between equals. This was always the idea of our foreign policy, my foreign policy, that Europe is cooperation instead of confrontation and that we have a partnership between equal and the fact that the European Union was founded by six member countries, three bigger and three smaller member countries, shows you that the idea, the biggest and most successful country has to dictate all the others, what they have to do is wrong. So we ask for cooperative opinion leadership, not for a dictation of, of, of one or two or three countries. And it's always important for me to include not only the Eurozone countries. For example, if you remember the strategic situation of Berlin and of, of Germany, our eastern partner, Poland, they are not a member of the, of the Eurozone. But what a successful country. They even had positive growth rates in the times of recession. What a successful country. Breathtaking, the success story of Poland in the last years. This is the philosophy and the background. And I, wait, I know, I know what you would like to get as an answer, <laughs> uh, as a journalist. And I know that uh, some of you are disappointed because they, they ask a question and then they want to have numbers and dates and, and, and uh, roadmaps. But this is not the way how it works in such a situation. I can only express a goodwill. I can only describe a mentality because we are, it's working progress. We are in negotiations. So I think it's easy to understand. It's very understandable so that Mr. Monti wants to see effects of the hard programs for the normal citizen in his own country. And please, Mr. Pivitera, if you look back to the very beginning of this new year, you saw that there was on the markets, can I use the word relaxation? Etwas, etwas Entspannung, kann man das so sagen? The markets were, yeah, calmer, this is the wrong word, but the, not only the, the, the uh, interest rates got down, there was a psychological uh, relaxation and not only uh, a decreasing interest rates. And then one of these wonderful rating agencies uh, started with some absolutely necessary public comments, <laughs> uh, which is an own story from my point of view. Uh, and I think competitiveness is the answer. <laughs> Competition is the answer, I should say. 
Well, so there was a decreasing, there were decreasing interest rates in, um, in January, early January, for Italy and for Spain, if you remember. And I think this shows us that the agreement of the 9th of December worked. And I understand completely uh, the position, for example, of the Italian government uh, that they, uh, of course, want to tell their own people it works, our program works, and uh, we get a response for our hard work. And believe me, I remember, I mean, 10 years ago, Germany was the sick man of Europe. Uh, just remember how the, 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 the media discussed uh, the German situation 10 years ago. And I remember what it meant for us as politicians to go onto the streets to discuss this with people who demonstrated and to tell them, I'm sorry, we would like to give you better news, but it is necessary that we have to change, and that change is necessary, and that we have to reduce our, our um, uh, deficit and uh, our uh, public spending. Uh, about um, my, the third question I will answer secondly is about NATO enlargement. Um, I would like to say uh, that uh, NATO enlargement is always on the agenda. But it's too early to answer you as a student, if I understand you right, that you can tell it your professor uh, <laughs> how the decisions and the results will be in Chicago. It's a bit too early. But the German policy is, of course, for us, NATO is always, has always been not only an alliance for security. And by the way, Germany showed solidarity. If you look back 10 years ago after the 9th of 11, when the mission started in Afghanistan, we were there, we were together. We knew that we owe you the same solidarity you showed us in the last decades. But for us, NATO is always more than a security alliance. For us, NATO is also uh, a community of values. And of course, countries who are on their way with rule of law, good governance, um, and, and democratic reforms, uh, we are interested to integrate them. But uh, don't uh, uh, misinterpret this in the sense that I want to make any remark to one special country. This is an abstract <coughs> description of our policy. And it's not possible for me as foreign minister to answer this question before uh, we have an agreement uh, in, in, uh, in Chicago or a bit earlier. We will see. Um, my last answer is to the second question about um, Libya, Tunisia, and Egypt. I think we have to differentiate. There are a, various, a variety, I'm sorry, of different developments in those countries. For example, we have a discussion here, um, in, here when I say here, not in Washington, I mean in the Western world, I meant. It's the same in my country. Uh, that Islam, per se, is uh, not, you cannot bring together with democracy and so on and so on. And I think uh, we, we, if we look to each country in the region, you understand that Tunisia is not the same uh, with Libya, or the development is not the same like in Libya or like in Egypt. Tunisia, from my point of view, has a realistic chance to become a road model for the whole region. There is a start after the latest elections with a party I expect and I hope that they become what we one day will call an Islam democratic party, like we have Christian democratic parties in, in uh, Europe, if it goes well. It's not for sure. It's not decided yet. They have probably the first third of their way behind them, and two-third uh, they have to go. But uh, I think it is, um, it is uh, positive. In Egypt, it's a very fragile situation at the moment. And therefore, our transformation partnership the offer for our transformation partnership is uh, so constructive. 
in Libya. I think I have just been there a few days ago. I think um, they understood very well <coughs> that they need an inclusive policy to integrate all the others if they want to be successful. I welcome this. And I uh, left Libya much more positive than I was before I um, uh, arrived in the country. So I think it's also positive. But what I would like to propose and what I would like to ask everyone is, let us not only look to those countries who choose the revolutionary way. There are some countries who choose the evolutionary way. And I think we also should offer them the transformation uh, partnership. And of course, it's necessary to support the civil society. It's necessary to uh, support them by the developments of, of uh, a media system, free media system, with many, with pluralism. Of course, it's necessary to work and to defend the women's rights and, and many other things. But personally, I'm 100% I'm convinced the success of the democratic transformation or of the transformation into the direction of democracy will depend also on a positive economic development. They need a transformation dividend, which, they, which change the lives for the normal families in these countries. I have been on the Tahir Square. I have been two times after the revolution in Tunisia now. And I can only tell you the people I met there, especially the young generation, they asked for political participation. They asked for their, and they protested for their democratic rights, for their fundamental civil and human rights. But they also seek for a better life, for a better life for themselves and for their families. And this is the reason why I think those countries in the region who decide to go the way into the direction of democracy, they need our support, which means also that we have to open our markets for the products, because if we want to have a sustainable, constructive development in these countries, we have to help them with their economic development and their economic success, because a revolution is the one thing, but the better life is the proof, the best proof to the normal people that democracy is uh, not only something for academic discussions, that this is also decisive for them and for their destiny and for the destiny of their families. Thank you so much. I apologize if I couldn't satisfy you and every question. Uh, just imagine you would sit here. Um, I wish you all the best. Thank you so much. And I hope to see you soon Thank again. You.